Well, this is the third time, so hopefully this is the charm. This is Shirley Gutkowski with part two of Evolution, Epigenetics, and the Tinkering of Humans. And we're going to just launch right into the second half. I'm so sorry. I don't know what is happening with all of the audio on these recordings in this last little bit here. So here we go. Please refrain from taking any kind of photos or, or screenshots of any of the people in this presentation. I'd like to start the second half with this video of what nursing should be and how it should look. I also got this from YouTube and you can find it very easily. In order for effective breastfeeding to occur, a good latch is required between the infant mouth and the breast. An effective latch requires a few things from the infant. The mouth is widely open with lips that are flared or curled out. The tongue is extended over the gum and under the nipple. The nipple needs to be fully inserted into the mouth including some or all of the areola. If any of these factors are missing, breastfeeding may become ineffective. Symptoms for the mother include prolonged feedings, painful nipples, and decreased milk production, while infants may exhibit noisy suckling and gas pains. A normal infant tongue has good mobility. Tongue tie is when the tongue is stuck to the floor of the mouth preventing adequate mobility, which leads to an ineffective latch. The tongue tie may also be hidden under the mucosal lining, a condition called posterior tongue tie. With tongue tie, the tongue tip does not extend over the gum causing the newborn's gum to chew on the nipple during feeding. Also, the up-down motion of the tongue is hindered preventing an adequate suck resulting in decreased milk production. A surgical procedure called tongue tie release can easily correct this cause of ineffective breastfeeding. Upper lip tie is when the newborn's upper lip does not curl up or flare out enough resulting in loss of suction and the nipple to be incompletely engaged within the mouth. A surgical procedure called upper lip tie release can easily correct this cause of ineffective breastfeeding. So as you can see, um, the milk is ejected much behind the um, the hard palate and it really the milk doesn't really come in contact with the teeth at all in an evolutionarily appropriate oral cavity if the tongue is tied then we start to see more and more dental decay and i think that because of the way that um, the epigenetics have been playing out with our diet and with our environments and with the uh, women being born with all the eggs they're ever going to have we are we're just getting mis mixed messages. Dental decay is not a...
um, it's not an outward problem. It's a problem from the inside out. And I don't know that many enough dentists understand that it's the nutrition of the whole body that makes dental decay even possible. In a healthy person, even with poor oral hygiene, in quotes, we have um, we have a situation where the body is not supporting the elimination of pathogenic bacteria. So getting to the root of the problem, we have to get to the um, to the systemic health of the person. If a child is presenting with a lot of dental decay, then we start need to start looking at other things, not just the diet as a surface on the enamel. Baby formula is getting very difficult to find, or has had been, and this is one of the drawbacks of all of this, and it really promotes the idea of some kind of nefarious um, entity behind the scenes manipulating everybody and everything. Uh, it's, um, I don't even know what to say about that. I'm just going to leave it just out there like that. But there's just so many weird things that are happening kind of all at the same time. And sometimes I wonder if it's just that I'm old enough to recognize all of it or if there's really something crazy going on, especially in all of the sugar um, shenanigans that happened, the paying off of researchers, all of the things that have happened in the last two years with respect to research and silencing. Um, it's just weird, all the things that are going on. Breastfeeding is the optimal way to start an infant on its way through a healthy life. It's not just the milk. It's not just formula. It's the pressure of the breast against the palate. It's the tongue being free, moving up and down. And it's the, the competing forces of the tongue and the cheek and the lips. And all of that helps form that craniofacial respiratory complex that we've been talking about. And without the breast in there, we have to really figure out what we can do to replace that that helpful forming unit of the and we have to also make sure that the mother is primed and healthy to provide good breast milk the breast milk is changing constantly based on the infant's needs so pumping and storing milk while it sounds really good and it can be optim you know you can do it but what if your baby is starting a little infection and it's now getting the milk all day at uh from a bottle from not the mother right so the mother stored the milk weeks ago or days ago when the baby wasn't sick. So now the baby is sick. Now the mother's milk is going to be primed for providing nutrition for a baby who's becoming ill. And it's still getting the milk that was three days ago, two days ago. So it's, um, you're, we're not honoring that part of, of the, um, of the human system of the dyad and I know that sounds terrible and I know there's a lot of people that are going to feel guilty about whatever they did but welcome to motherhood the more we know the more questions we have and the more guilt there is for us to pass around um, it's uh, it's been a crazy crazy ride and technically speaking what I've been telling people in this age group is to buy a smaller house get a cheaper smaller car live closer to work and somebody should stay home with the baby um and with the children i don't see that that should be a problem and i think maybe in another two generations that will be the norm but right now it's an uphill battle Vitamin D is important because it's a pre-hormone and it sets us up for a lot of other things. If the mother does not have optimal vitamin D levels, she's not passing on those optimal vitamin D levels to the child. And if the child's not getting them, they're not getting all the pre-hormones. If the mother is on a fat-free diet and vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin, in quotes, where, where's the store?
where are the stores so we really have to think about how all of this stuff goes together it's like a twisted balloon every time you squeeze one part another part pops out and to try to equalize the pressure throughout the thing is really tricky so zipping backwards into time um, very helpful the term IBCLC is an indication that the person has taken advanced classes in lactation consulting in helping and understanding the dyad between the mother and the child and the development of the craniofacial respiratory complex and all that goes with it. Dental hygienists have been notoriously cut out of this loop mostly because it's assumed that we only have an associate's degree when really we have a four-year degree that we paid for but we only can show an associate's degree um, so there's a new facebook i don't know it's a year old now or whatever facebook group for um, dental hygienists to go into lactation consulting and we need more dental people with this degree like a lot more this is really at cr the critical stage as we go and illuminate as we go through the first thousand days continues on um, through weaning and baby led weaning the idea of chewing hard foods and just the idea of chewing period when we look at babies who are eating we wonder what muscles are really engaged as the baby is eating in different ways it's always for us encouraged by most of um, the world right now in the united states to give the baby a spoonful of a rice cereal or some other grain as a first food or fruit which is very high in fructose and i i have some real concerns about that whole first food thing but even the, the delivery of the food can be problematic. Now this video is, these both these videos I took from YouTube and it just kind of highlights a little bit the difference between shoving a spoon into a baby's mouth for their first food as opposed to a baby led weaning approach where the baby feeds herself the food. Now, obviously, this is a banana and whatever about the fructose um, and whatever about the bananas and all this stuff. The point of this part here is to show you what's happening with the face. All of these babies are about six months of age. No baby should be given solid food until they can sit up, regardless of how tired you are and how much the baby's not sleeping. If the baby's not sleeping, there's something wrong with their mouth but it's just a gag fest when you start kind of jamming the spoon back there. Even if you're dainty, they don't know what to do with it. It's too soft. It's um, slipping around. With the baby led weaning, they're learning and processing as they go. This baby led weaning video, I'm gonna move forward a little bit here because there's something very interesting near the end that most of us don't think about either. And that is how to drink when you're a baby. Now, Dr. Um, Dr. Kevin Boyd says that if you cannot nurse, do not go to a bottle and go to open cup feeding, even for an infant. Now, this baby is six months old. The cup is not full. Boom. So that's how this whole thing can go. You don't need to um, you don't need to push food into your baby's mouth. They keep spitting it out. They don't know what to do with it. This baby led weaning gives them an opportunity to
do everything on their own and learn while they're doing it and use the appropriate muscles and learn how to use those muscles. We also need to remember that meat is not just for grown-ups, that the babies can eat meat right off the bone. Did I just say give an entire turkey leg to a baby? No. I'm saying whatever you're eating for dinner, take the bone that's left over with a little bit of meat on there and let the baby play with it until they get the meat off. Chewing is food processing, and it should be the first food processing that we do. This is the book, Baby Led Weaning, The Essential Guide, that I recommend for everyone and a good gift to give to anyone that's having a baby, even if it's the third baby. Baby Led Weaning really makes the muscles of mastication work. And you, there are a couple of little things you have to know about size because we don't have this ancestral wisdom that gets passed down from generations, um, we have to have a book that's kind of putting it all together. Please, please don't forget the meat. Everyone needs enough fat and enough saturated fat to grow the brain and grow that myelin sheath that we talked about in part one um, to stop any kind of malfiring in the nervous system. And let's also remember that hunter-gatherers were taller and lived longer than our farming um, family members. Farming led to a lot of problems. And this is why, because when a woman is pregnant, especially with a girl baby, she's affecting the DNA of her own body, the DNA of the infant, of the, the fetus that she's growing, and the reproductive cells in the fetus. That's what is getting translated. We're drinking our salads, we're eating chew-free foods, and we're using anti-human fats. And all of that is has to be dealt with from a DNA level. And now even a mitochondrial level. I was just listening to another about that. So just think about this in nesting dolls. So you have this doll here that was born in 1981. And this doll is produced from the DNA that was fed by or managed by this person here. This person that was born in 1941. In 1961 is, so 1941 is about the time when the sugar industry started to manipulate the data. And just to drive this home, it wasn't that they were using tobacco industry tactics. The tobacco industry took the tactics of the sugar industry to obfusc obfuscate science and result from smoking. That's really where all of this really comes down. So this is where the sugar industry started to do all of their stuff. This is the person that was affected by the sugar stuff, and this is also when high fructose corn syrup was pushed in to our diet um, to a very high degree. And then in the 1970s, it was suddenly safe and effective for girls, young women, to do all the things that boys were doing without consequences, or so they thought. So this person here has all of the bad habits of 1941 and diets and all of the bad habits and diet from 1961. And then by the time this kid in 2010 was born, you've got this through thread of improper human diet, then shenanigans and acting out and being a boy. Um, and then all of that is now shifted over to here. Um, I have a lot more to say about that. And uh, if you want to read my Substack paper on that, I think I still only have two papers on there. But I kind of go into this a little bit deeper, which isn't really appropriate for a venue. The idea that grandmas pass on their history is valid. And it's fun. And it's important for the grandchildren to get this information. but doesn't just 
go on the one-on-one. -on -one. It's not just telling your grandchildren how life was back in the 1970s or whatever. It's not like that. It's all the things that we thought we could do that weren't going to be harming our children, but they were indirectly and harming our grandchildren, as it turns out. We were, I was smoking. I was allowed to have two drinks a day, so I don't know that I took advantage of it. Um, I didn't smoke while I was pregnant, but I smoked in between for a number of, of years. So all of that kind of stuff is getting translated over. I mean, it's just so, so sad. And we have to know this now so that we can help the next generation get to their next steps and get to their next optimal health. The consequences of what we do when we are sowing our wild oats really does go beyond what we what we think. Transgender transgenderal is what is that word? Gen generational boy transgenerational programming all happens because of what's been happening and it didn't used to matter so much time was slower we didn't have like advertising to tell us that doritos were the perfect snack oh never mind you could eat a whole 20 ounce bag of doritos and what does it say when you can eat a 20 ounce bag of doritos but you cannot eat a 20 ounce steak what does that say Plus, you're dumping, you know, Pepsi or beer or Mountain Dew or something on top of those chips and we're and then be hungry. And just right there, that should tell you that this is a problem. We're on this plant focused dietary trend right now and will probably be for another while yet. But nobody's well, maybe not nobody, but there's too many people drinking their salad. What is that? Be doing that. It's giving the wrong message to our DNA. Um, this may be oversimplified, and there's probably some eggheads around that are like, oh, surely you're all wet. But this is generically what is going on. This information is translating through our patients. We need saturated fats. We can get some saturated fats from fruit but it's not the same as animal fat. So we really need to think about the whole package of what it means to be. Um, gorillas are often um, exalted as the strong vegetarians or strong vegan, or they never eat human flesh or they never eat the flesh of animals or whatever. Uh, but they do eat you know, grubs and stuff that crawls around. They don't only eat leaves, but they do spend an inordinate amount of time finding and eating food. It's crazy. If you really want to be a vegan, are you prepared to spend 16 hours a day preparing and eating your food? Obviously not. Everybody's got a ninja mixer and everybody's drinking. We wouldn't have time to invent the internet, invent wheels, invent fire, um, invent farming, invent farm implements, invent cities, invent sky rises, invent everything that you hold dear needed to come because our brains were filled with fat. We're not gorillas. We're not cows. We're humans. We're completely unique from most. For instance, our intestinal length is half that of our nearest ape cousins. It's half the distance. The orangutan cecum is that big, not the balloon of the stomach, it's the big balloon under the stomach balloon. <laughs> and it's uh, that cecum is necessary for plant matter. Um, breakdown. The cecum is filled with bacteria that break down the plant matter and turn the plant matter into um, butyrate, which is the precursor to fats. So they have to make their own fat. We have to go out and get our fat from other mammals. The pH levels of our stomach mimic those of real complete carnivores like lions. 
um, and other big cats that never eat a leaf unless it's part of the contents of the stomach of the animal that they killed. That's why they have a little bit of a cecum. That's why we have our appendix. I'm sure that that is the, um, the result of the reduced size. This is a really pretty good graphic of what happened to our brain size over time. Two and a half million years ago, Homo habilis had a brain size of about 650 cc's, which is about half of what we've got right now. Their tools that they invented, because they were getting good fats in their diet, were intended to break the bones to extrude or get the fat out of these bones of the scavenged animals. That's what increased our brain size from 650 cc to about 1,000 cc in under a million years. This brain size increase allowed us to come up with implements and the ability not to just scavenge but to hunt and to track animals and to kill the prey. And then eating these gigantic animals gave us even more fat because they have a lot of fat and that increased our brain size to 150 cc's. And then we started to farm and then we started to hunt smaller game. We started to hunt with um, our partners, the dogs and wolves, and then now we are in a situation where our brain size has been decreasing as our diet has shifted from almost exclusively meat and hunted animals to actual farming. The gorilla stomach has to look that bulbous because of the long, long intestine and their need to break down the leaves and the twigs that they eat into fat so that they can have good cell integrity. So they're completely made differently than what humans With respect to chewing, not only do we need to not have to chew twigs and leaves, we are eating foods that require less chewing cycles and or minutes of chewing throughout time. Since World War II, we've cut everything in half. These mixers are not healthful and not helpful. Not only that, how many people did it take to make the blender and get the raw materials for the blender? I mean, if you're going to go that way, really go that way. How, how many miles was it driven from the place um, where it was made to where it was where you bought it? And not only that, but once you start putting fiber through a blender, you break it down into simple sugars, and then you provide your body with a huge insulin response. The insulin seems to be the big red flag right now. It's the um, hormone that is causing all of the rest of our health problems. Seed oils are hard to get. You have to really, really squeeze a seed to get any amount of oil out of it at all. And then we have to, we have to disinfect it. We have to deodorize it. We have to clarify it. We have to heat it. We have to cool it. We have to do a bunch of other things. And it's just not a healthful kind of a situation. My mother often wonders about nut milks, and she's like, well, how hard do you have to squeeze a, a soybean to get soy milk? And I'm like, well, how much do you have to squeeze a kernel of corn to get corn oil out of it? It's just not what they're meant to do. Many, many, many plants have anti-nutrients, and even eggs, even eggs have anti-nutrients. The egg white, the uncooked egg white, will actually block 
any nutri nutrition, especially the biotin, from the egg yolk where we have a lot of nutrition. Then we package the white like it's some superfood. But this is, again, another thing that we do in the United States is we fragment all of our food into these component parts. And then we think, well, this is the part that makes the most difference. So we're going to package that and sell it to people. We can get more fat, more saturated fat in jars we don't have to save it although that's the most economical way to get these fat we're starting to see that alzheimer's is also a fat deficiency and that people with mild cognitive impairment or dementia have um, a higher incidence of or a higher incidence of mild cognitive impairment on a higher carbohydrate diet than those on a higher fat diet. Plants have tannins, which interfere with digestion. They have lectins, which are all there to protect the plant from being eaten by insects. Well, we're not any, we're not an insect, so we're not really going to be affected by those things until they start accumulating in our body, and they do. The oxalate is exactly the problem that I suffer with um, because I have a I have kidney stones. I've had two kidney stones in my time on the planet, um, and they were enormous. They were nine millimeters. It was it was a crazy crazy time, and I wouldn't wish it on anyone. And I don't eat that many plants. Turns out that fructose may be the big cult, um, as defined by. Um, Dr. Perlmutter and by Dr. Johnson. I've created this nutrition continuum because I think it's really important to understand how we get from food to something to eat and then eventually just to be just toxic. If you take an apple, that's food. If you cut it and dry it a little bit, turn it into, you know, just a little easier to travel. Um, less moist ingredient, then it's still food, but it's making its way to something to eat. And then you start doing something that does not happen in nature anywhere. There is no food in nature that has fat and sugar together. This is where a lot of people are saying is the big hiccup when you start putting fat and sugar together. And then you add a little bit more, you add a little more fat, you add a little more sugar, you you cook down maybe the actual food, and now it's not it's not even something to eat anymore. It's just on its way to being a toxin, which in this ex, uh, this example would be fruit juice, apple juice. I don't know, did I burn out my kids' um, pancreas because they had apple juice? A lot, a lot of apple juice, like a lot, a serious lot. I don't know. I don't know if I'm ever going to. And then we have this whole evolutionary kind of an idea that was promoted by um, Darwin and all the rest of humanity <laughs> since Darwin started to write about it. But we can't count on evolution anymore. The people who are super sick just get better and better medicine you pharma but we can be a very sick person we can be very harmed from the food and everything that we're eating and still reproduce although it's getting more and more difficult and natural selection is taking um, a back seat to our interventions because we do have a nice brain some examples would be progress versus Innovation. Innovation would be writing that came from oral storytelling and then from writing into email, which is still writing, still reading and writing, and then texting. Well, writing letters and going to a mobile phone is maybe more innovative and it could be helpful, but 
we don't understand all of the consequences. Look what happens when we start thinking about mobile phone use and how people are so dopamine attracted to phones. I put some little stories together here. So for instance, if a baby couldn't nurse in the time before time, the baby would perish. Eventually we decided or we discovered that wet nursing could be a solution or uh, getting small animals to produce milk and then give that milk to the to the human infant. And then we decided, oh, well, this is good, but maybe it'll be even more convenient if we have bottles and if we have formula. And sure, the kid is developing. But today we know, and if we look backwards, we can start to see the trends. The child is developing ADHD, sleep apnea, OCD, diabetes, and many, many other problems. We used to scavenge. Humans used to scavenge for meat. Then we somehow found some fire, and then we were releasing more and more nutrients. It was easier to get to the fat. We co-evolved with animals, and we started farming. And now the farms are toxic. They're putting too much junk into the dirt. They're using too many chemicals in order to farm. And they're putting animals in some really dire, creepy little straits, and that nobody wants to eat an animal from that. Hunter-gatherers used to be roaming bands of people, and then they found that maybe farming would be okay. And then we started to live in larger and larger communities, and that brought more and more problems with it. It brought pestilence and disease. It brought um, wars and arguments over land. And then we started to interfere into those large communities where we started to have rules that affected everyone, even though only a few were not on board. Um, I always like to say the many have to pay for the few because some people will drive 70 miles an hour through a little subdivision with tiny roads. Um, we all have to go 25 no matter what. <laughs> Just because some people don't think about stopping at a you know, at an intersection or creating an intersection um, that doesn't require stopping, we have to all stop at stop signs for no good reason for some. Oh, um, those are just my car things. I've got I've got a bunch of others. <laughs> um, foods didn't cause decay. Uh, the increase in carbohydrates started to cause decay. It's uh, funny to hear some of these archaeologists talking about how they don't find human skulls with dental decay until the farming started to take hold. Then we're, instead of really addressing the diet, which is what Dr. Weston Price was doing, we're like, oh yeah, fluoride, that means we'll have less decay. And now we've got fluoride in beer, we've got fluoride in um, canned beans, we've got fluoride everywhere. It's everywhere. And we never, never adjusted the diet. Skin color managed vitamin D. As we went further and further north, it got colder and colder. And now we have more clothing, which blocks the vitamin D uh, creation in our skin because we just don't have as much skin. So our skin became lighter still. Um, and we started to even get even lower vitamin D, even though. And then, oh my gosh, we have cancer scares. So now we have to put sunscreen on and now we have even lower vitamin D and we have the toxins that come from sunscreen. It's not always, it's not always helpful. These poor little babies were sleeping outside in this, uh, it's probably an orphanage. They didn't have childcare center, maternity hospital. So they're putting out tiny babies. These babies don't look newborn, but still. You can see their mouths are closed. That's cool. Um, taking a nap outside in the freezing weather. And then we've taken this idea of plants and we've turned it into, um, ugh, into this. This reductionist thinking, this thinking that we can take the benefits of plant A and then cut it into little parts, put it into a powder, and people really just don't need to eat. What's going to happen if we keep not using our mouths? What's going to happen? Are we going to end up in another 
20 generations with just a slit for pills to go in. One of the top um, doctors, the cardiologist, is uh, vegan-ish, let's say, or vegetarian. And uh, he, he says he takes 120 supplements every day. Who can sustain that? This is on my Facebook feed constantly, this stupid cachava. There's no food in there. What are super greens? Once they start, you know those, oh, when you go to the grocery store and you're walking through the tomato aisle and you see some tomatoes that have brown spots, those tomatoes don't get thrown away or if the carrot has a weird shape. That doesn't get tossed. It gets converted into something like this. All those unappetizing foods that you thought um, would not be good for you or that might smell bad or whatever, they're torn apart and they're put in powders and then skinny, bright white people try to get you enticed into drinking it instead of eating F-O-O-D. How busy do you have to be to drink a, a meal instead of just eating a meal? We're so conditioned to eating six times a day right now. Another driver from the 1980s that you can't not be eating. And this is part of getting into this problem with um, obesity because we're never giving our body a chance to recover from the previous meal and for the insulin levels to go down and for the stomach to empty completely that's never you're never given a chance in the wild before time right the time before time there were many times when there was a meal during the day or you had to skip a meal in the winter particularly which is why all of our fruits become ripest in the late summer and fall because that's when we're supposed to be har harvesting those plant sugars and storing all of those calories so that we can make it over the winter. This idea that animals are causing or animal foods are causing the planet to go south is just not true. Um, the way that we farm animals can be improved quite a bit. There's plenty of room for improvement there, but just by reducing all of the animals from the U.S. would only reduce greenhouse gas emissions by under 3%. So, you know, it's, you'd really need this, like I said, a twisted balloon. You need to be very, very educated. If you hear this, then think of that and then wonder to yourself, is this right? Is that right? We have to observe, we have to question, we have to formulate our own hypotheses, find out if there are others working on a similar hypothesis, and then um, we're going to try out the hypothesis and analyze the results, come to some kind of a conclusion, make our own observations some more, and then provide more questions, and just go round and around in a circle. We really, this is how we learn anything. We can't be um, obfuscated from, or information can't be hidden from us. It needs to be available to all of us. This is how we get so, so smart so fast, because all of these places are allowing us free access. And this last couple of years has been horrible with the amount of um, hiding going on. This great food experiment has been going on long enough, and if you look backwards, you can really see what is going on. We cannot look at our health conditions right now in the United States without looking at what has happened to foods, how the seed oils have infiltrated, how we've modified our foods, even the grown foods, to be even more sweet. Um, honey crisp apples is something that uh, Dr. Lustig talks about a lot. Um, there's also cotton candy grapes, which are also GMO for super sweetness. And the demonization of saturated fat is probably the biggest crime that we've got going right now. And let's remember that this epigenetic thread is where all of this is coming from. So around our genes are little 
tags that read our environment and what we've been eating with food and that tells the DNA what to do next. And because the changes are so slow, right, just because you eat a vegan diet, I'm sorry, vegans, um, I really want you to eat whatever you want to eat, but there are certain things I think that we should be addressing, and that is the amount of saturated fat that you're getting somehow, somewhere. Um, but it takes, it might not show up in that first generation. It may take three generations before it starts to show up in the children and then the teenagers and whatnot. But we're not going to think to look back to see what happened two generations. We think that this baby on the right is normal when it's really common. A normal baby has the mouth closed and breathes through their nose. What to do when you have a baby with an open mouth? Constantly be on alert to close the lips. Get everybody involved in closing the lips. That will help promote good nasal breathing and nasal airway. The baby's lips should be together all the time unless they're feeding or they're cooing or talking. This is where this really came onto the um, onto the radar of Dr. Kevin Boyd was this textbook here, uh, Clinician's Guide to Breastfeeding, and they flat out said, hey, babies are born with retrognathia, which means that the chin is back, in order to facil facilitate travel through the birth canal. And he was like, oh, really? See, this is where, it, where professional curiosity really starts to become important. He, as a professional pediatric dentist with a master's degree in food science, was like, really, where does it show? How do we know that this is true? So he went on a mission just like Dr. Weston Price did, and he found that retrognathia was only visible in modern human times before the Industrial Revolution. Before that, in pre industrial times, fetal skulls all had chins that were equal to the maxilla. They were not backwards at all. And we haven't changed that much as a species to have this be happening. So really, uh, Industrial Revolution was 150 years ago. That is 10,000 years in evolution times worth of change. This is the story. Now, this is a, an image, the x-ray of that skull that was on the far right. And you can see that Dr. Boyd put this little angle there on the mandible. And you can see it's like 90 degrees. And this is your typical sonogram for anybody. So what are we going to do for this baby? What can we do? Can we grow that in utero? Should we? How are we going to do that? What are we going to do? It's, it's, not, it's not something that we can fix. Not until the baby is born. And who's going to do anything with this baby? Who's going to do anything with this baby? You're going to wait until they're seven for their first orthodontic evaluation. These chins are disappearing. And this poor father was asking me for advice on his baby. And he sent me baby. And I was like, hold on. What's going on with your own chin there, sir? It's about the maxilla. The maxilla needs to grow in order for the whole face to be held up. The sphenoid bone behind it also needs some help from the expanding. And then this probably is the most important little paper. Um, and I don't know that ethically we could do this again. <laughs> but Dr. Pottinger had a lot of cat that from a study that he was doing for something else and people were bringing him cats because they knew he needed cats. So he um, he divided the cat pen into four segments. All the cats received one 
di one serving a day of a species specific diet of raw meat and raw milk. The three other pens, three of the four pens were fed one diet across generations that were deficient or changed. There was cooked meat and raw milk, cooked meat and pasteurized milk, and cooked meat and condensed milk. I think those were the three separate diets. And you can see this is the healthy cat. This is what happens when you look at the skeleton of a healthy cat. All the symphysis are closed. All of the um, joints are closed. Everything is in three for the whole skull. This is the first poor nutrition group. The tissue, the bone tissue, is reduced in calcification. It's not as dense. The pieces are not fused together. The symphysis is not closed in the skull. And by the third generation, nothing was working. It was only like calcium content of the bone was at 3%. It should be like 40%. The skulls were smaller, poorly developed zygoma. Sinuses were poorly developed. Is it starting to sound familiar? Those in the third generation of the poor diet exhibited exhaustion, poor coordination. I can't tell you how many patients I have with poor coordination. They all had dental problems. This was the first time that um, asthma was described in cats on this diet. The reproduction was also miserable. It was very hard for those cats to be interested in sex and to conceive and to bring their charges, their fetal cats to birth. Many were stillborn. Lots of and then, thank you for for this, Dr. Pottinger. He started to feed all of those pens the same species-specific diet of raw meat and milk, and it took four more generations to get back to physiological normalcy of those cats. There is a Price uh, Pottinger and Price. Price Pottinger organization that's still active, but not as active as the Weston A. Price Foundation, which has annual meetings and has a lot of resources and recipes all over the place. So I would encourage you to look into those because we can't keep living with crooked teeth because it's just a sign of a deterioration of the whole human condition. I like this video because it kind of helps describe everything. You can also find this on YouTube. The sweet smell of fruit doesn't normally send rats running. But when researchers paired the orange, cherry, almondy scent of the chemical acetophenone with a painful electric shock, lab rats quickly learned to fear it. Along the way, extra neurons sprouted in their noses and in the smell processing center of their brains, making them super sensitive to the scent. This result isn't shocking. What is surprising is that the rat's pups and their pups' pups were also startled by the smell of acetophenone and had the same extra neurons as their fathers, despite never having been introduced to either their dad's or the fruity scent before. But how could the pups have inherited something that their fathers learned? Basic genetics tells us that only DNA gets passed along to offspring. Characteristics like memories, scars, or giant muscles can't get passed on since acquiring them doesn't alter the genetic code. But it turns out that instilling fear in the rats did trigger genetic changes, not in the DNA sequence itself, but instead in how that code was read and used in the rats' bodies. In every cell, biological machinery constantly translates DNA into the proteins needed to carry out vital processes. Chemical switches attached to the DNA turn genes on or off or up and down, telling the machinery which proteins to produce and in what quantities. These switches, called epigenetic tags, are why a kidney cell looks and acts differently than a skin or nerve cell, even though all three cells have identical DNA. But the switches in any one cell aren't set in stone. Teaching those rats to fear the fruity smell switched one of their smell sensing genes into overdrive. Researchers don't know all the places in the rats' bodies where this switch got flipped, but they know it happened in one key set of cells, the rats' sperm cells, which would one day pass along the tweaked genetic material, making the next generation of rats super sensitive to acetophenone. 
Rodents aren't the only creatures demonstrating this weird type of inheritance. In Ivakalik, Sweden, boys who suffered through tough winter famines went on to have super healthy sons, with extremely low rates of heart disease and diabetes. And their son sons had the same excellent health, living an unbelievable 32 years longer on average than the grandsons of boys who hadn't gone hungry. To be clear, this does not mean that we should start starving our kids for the benefit of future generations. Scientists don't even know yet exactly which switches the Swedish famines flipped. While we have been able to connect specific epigenetic changes to health effects in mice, we're a long way off from being able to make those connections in humans. That may sound like a bummer, but it's mostly because we humans don't live in the well-controlled environment of a laboratory. And for that, we should be grateful. So, I know it's not popular to say the anything. The sweet smell. Um, feeding children necessarily, especially not feeding children, but children do not need to eat six times a day. They need a break as well. And that study or that observation of that, those conditions from Sweden there um, is really telling. Kids today are grazers. They often don't have a good understanding of their physiology, big surprise, right? Most adults don't either. And so they just eat whenever anything little happens or if they might feel a little hunger pang or a little twang of hunger. And then the parents are like, well, if they're hungry, they should eat. And I would hate for them to be hungry. Well, really be hungry until dinner and then have dinner at a reasonable hour. And they don't need to have six meals a day it's not healthy for them so i'm going to leave it at that and we can see this through the generations the baby boomer generation still had to skip dinner if they were naughty they had to go to bed without dinner nobody died because they skipped dinner for one or two or three days 
or skip dessert or something like that, that food was a, a motivator for the baby boomer generation. And today we can see potentially the results of caving into the base needs of children and allowing them to eat constantly. And the easiest thing to eat constantly is grain, is grain-based foods. And if you were to offer them a hamburger, which I do recommend for everybody to have some already cooked hamburger patties in the refrigerator for snacks. And if they're not willing to eat that hamburger, then they should not have anything to eat. Then they're they're not uh, they're not having a true hunger pain. They're having something else, some emotional something that is triggering a need for food. And this is what's been happening. This is a really good example, also taken from uh, YouTube. This is published on March seventh, twenty fifteen. The baby was diagnosed with severe sleep apnea at two and a half years old. They went ahead and had the, this video was two weeks before the surgery. They went and had the tonsils and adenoids removed and this is six days after the surgery. But notice the, t the mandible is still retruded and that could resolve a little bit still breathing through his mouth. Uh, we know that tonsil and adenoid removal is temporary, but he probably grew three inches that first couple of months. Kids really thrive after that surgery. However, it is lasting. If not dentistry, who should oversee the growth and development of the craniofacial respiratory complex? We have changed over time. Our skulls are bigger because of fat. We can change our faces from improper breathing. Just think of mouth breathing in a child. Just think of that baby that we just saw. Um, if the mouth is open, what is it doing to the jaw joint? Just think about that for a few minutes. We also know that statistic significant differences were found in nasal volumes between people who were mouth breathers and uh, sinus or nose breathers. So we know that we're losing volume by breathing through our nose or through our mouth. And I often bring this picture up for uh, my clients and ask, you know, what, what are you going to do? If you are 40 years old and you have the sinuses size of a 12 year old, how are you supposed to really optimize your performance if your sinuses are super small because nobody told you to breathe with your mouth closed? Breastfeeding is one really important. And make it be as long as possible. Really, three years is not too long. I shudder at the thought of having to nurse somebody for three solid years, but there's a lot of people who think it's awesome. And it is, it does offer a lot. My um, grandson weaned himself at a year. His sister was a little bit longer, but they, they stopped on their own. My amazing um, daughter-in-law was just super chill about all of it because we need to grow these faces. This is not normal. This is common. So really start forcing the issue of oral breathing versus sinus breathing or nasal breathing. Dr. Boyd also says the time, ideal time to treat orthodontically is before 72 months. That transverse growth deficiency will never self-correct. Retrognathia will never self-correct. Bimaxillary retrusion will not self-correct. So you need to get in there as soon as possible. He has evidence of this occurring in the early 1900s in some of the textbooks on dentistry. And he 
often shows in his lectures little tiny, tiny arch expansion devices that were used back in the 1900s. As I mentioned, everything really changed after World War II, and in the early 1900s, we also had World War I. So we had two world wars. People are distracted, and they have other ways around it. This little kid was um, sleeping with a gerbil in his room. You can see his face in number C. I'm not sure what A and B is. I'm so sorry. I shouldn't probably put them up there, but there you go. Um, and then uh, he started oral breathing overnight. And then because his sinuses were filled from, it's not, <laughs> from being allergic to that critter. And eventually he just started oral breathing all the time. And you can see his chin retreat, re receded. His lips are parted. His nose looks bigger. Consequences are unbelievable. The only mammals on the planet that are obese are humans and their pets. And who feeds the pets? This is what this dog should look like. The other dog, I don't know what to say about that. Um, if we can't be strong for our pets, how are we going to be strong for ourselves? Animals who are kept in captivity are very often not eating species-specific foods. So I don't know about you, but if I saw cats like that at a zoo or whatever that kind of monkey is at a zoo, I would not go back there. And I would really hope that the zookeeper or the person in charge of feeding those particular animals was fired. We have to get on board with this breathing thing. Because of these epigenetic changes, more and more women, pregnant women, pregnant people are snoring. If they are snoring, they risk small for gestational age infants, early preterm births, all kinds of problems. So if you're having pregnant women, don't just talk to them about periodontal disease and all the bacteria and blah, blah, blah. That's all true, but it's very much more likely, especially in the United States, that they are breathing orally and that they are snoring and that they should have at least a temporary snoring device. Obstructive sleep apnea in children can be suggested by facial appearance and personal history, and then do a sleep study. Sleep disordered breathing in infants and children. Um, this paper is here is from 2007. Minimal, intervention, uh, minimal inter information is available concerning the dental treatment of this, these disorders. With the devastating effects sleep disorders can have on children and their families, dentists must recognize obvious symptoms and refer to manage uh, refer to physicians. So let me tell you that even though this is probably true, not enough physicians are on board either, and dentistry is just taking over. So we can refer as dentistry. Some of the symptoms in sleep disturbed breathing symptoms. Um, ask a seven year old if they wake up with headaches. I think you'll be surprised. Dry mouth, acting out in school, extended bedwetting, dental decay. Those are all symptoms of disturbed breathing during sleep. Measure the free tongue length, which is also known as the blade. So in this case, the blade length is zero. So the blade is from the tip to the insertion of the frenum. If it's less than 16 millimeters, there's an increased risk of OSA in, in the school-aged children. And who would have thought that we would have to fit kids with CPAP machines? And we have to stop being afraid of frenuloplasty and releasing the lingual frenum. And this has to be done correctly. That's just not good enough to just do a little slice there and create that diamond. You have to go into the tongue in order to find all of the other adhesions that have developed um, through epigenetic threads over time. 
speech improved almost 90%, solid feeding improved um, over 80%, as did sleep. 50% of delayed speech was improved after the procedure. Slow eaters ate more rapidly and the restless sleepers slept less restlessly, over 72% there. It was a pretty decent sized study. It had over 300 kids in um, a bunch of, I think it was a bunch of different places. Not sure if it was the same surgeon over time. This also needs to be addressed. If there's a labial frenum that's interfering with good mobility of the labia, then we have a problem. Especially so this is the ever popular Cambra carries imbalance. And I would like to add as a risk factor, a tongue tie or low labial freedom attachment. And as a protective factor, a freely moving tongue, a wide arch, and high labial freedom. When you have a patient with pointy arches like this, look for a tongue tie. Look for a problem. Look at this tongue here. It doesn't look very restricted. She's able to open her mouth. You can see the floor of the mouth is lifting a little bit. But more importantly and more telltale is that blanched freedom attachment. It's really blanched just from this simple posture. It's a little bit less blanched in the second picture, and then this ectopic attachment is also an indication. This is what allows the tongue to stick out further than what you would think. If this was attached at the premolar level, it probably wouldn't be um, as Bruxing, we always we were taught that it does not cause tori, but we know now that bruxing is probably a with breathing, with airway management, especially during sleep, where the tongue is kind of slumped into the airway. Usually it's tied into the airway. It's never tied out of the airway just for your edification. And then Look how long this person has been grinding and nobody did anything. <laughs> and it may have been just a tongue tie. So the body does not go into sleep, deep, deep sleep mode because the body is to be paralyzed during that time. And if the body's paralyzed, the whole airway may become occluded and not, and then the patient won't wake up. The, the person won't wake up. So in an effort to keep everybody alive, the triggers that move the jaw, move the jaw. The tongue tie is part of the... Look at this ectopic presentation of the floor of the mouth attachment of the frenum, the lingual frenum. It was probably attached onto the mandible and nobody noticed, nobody did anything about it. But by moving the tongue over and over, over the time of this person's being on the planet, look at what developed. I would encourage all of you to look for all of your patients that have a, you know, mandibular tori like this. Where is the attachment in the middle of it? Is it? Myofunctional therapy is helpful. It reduces. Sleep apnea scores, not in this paper, a different paper, um, by 50% in adults and 62% in children. So having an assessment by a myofunctional therapist is really, really helpful in helping you decide what is going on. And to just highlight this idea of the food and what's been going on in the food is this picture of one month for the family's diet. This is from a large article that looked at um, the globe and looked at what people eat in a month and how much they pay. And I would encourage you to really look at this picture and can you find any food? Almost everything in this picture is something to eat. I see some grapes there and there's a couple of tomatoes and a little bit of packaged meat, but the rest of it is all something to eat. It's just crazy. This is how we spend our hard-earned money.
if not dentistry, I can't say it enough, who is in charge with the growth and development of the cranial respiratory complex. And as a last slide, these are some things that um, we really need to think about with respect to where should we focus our attention right now. I think we need to focus on 12-year-old girls. They have to be prepared for the onslaught of lies and learn who to trust and how to trust authorities and what not to believe and how to not believe it. If they're making alcoholic beverages that are birthday cake flavored and cotton candy flavored, they are not targeting any man. This is for girls. They're targeting young women who already have been damaged by poor nutritional choices across generations so that they cannot make good or safe decisions. This, I think, is really one of the biggest things that we have to become aware of. And this is why I'm so hilarious and hysterical about this whole topic, um, about this epigenetic thing. Once I learned about epigenetics, I, it was like the key to everything for me because we can really see how things transpired over generations and that we have to do things now. Um, you know, it was a cat study. What if it was only half right? It's still dramatic. What if it took eight years of an improved diet for humans to outgrow all of the sh shenanigans that have been happening? Either way, we have to get on it. Right we have to grow into this, this thing. We have to really look at what's happening, what's ancestral for your ancestry. Are you from closer to the equator? What about your great, great, great grandparents? A good example right now is um, that Prince Harry, I think, the red-haired one, and his wife, um, whatever, Merkel or Markle or whatever. I don't know. I'm very bad with royal history. So one is from the north. The boy is from the north, the prince. And then she is not from the north. She's obviously from the south. She's very close. Her ancestry is closer to the equator. So what kind of a diet should their children eat? Just removing all judgments about anything other than what diets should they eat? What those children? Who's going to evaluate the genetic food expression for those kids? The other brother married a girl from the same latitude over generations. They've never, you know, her, whatever her name is. What the heck is her name? She's got a funny, Pippa? I don't know. Anyway, um, she is also from up there, so it's not that big a deal. But we have transportation. We fall in love with people that are not from our latitude, <laughs> and that needs to be accommodated some in the diet.